Now I'd just like to introduce the guest speakers for tonight. Rochelle Laking, who, I, as I mentioned, is part of our curatorial team, and artist Bonnie Devine. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, really, it's really inspiring to see you all here, you know, eager to learn about, about uh, the trade networks that existed here. Um, I want to first start by introducing Bonnie Devine, who joins me in conversation this evening about the Indigenous trade networks here on Turtle Island, which represents North and South, South America, and Toronto, which connected hundreds of nations. Uh, Bonnie Devine is a sculptor, painter, video maker, curator, and writer, a descendant of the Anishinaabe, the Anishinaabe of Ser Serpent River First Nations, Ganabajing, <laughs> on the north shore of Lake Huron. Um, Devine's work emerges from the storytelling and image-making traditions that are central to the Anishinaabe culture. Her art explores, explores issues of land, environment, treaty, history, and narrative. Though formally educated in sculpture and installation at the art, um, installation art at the Ontario College of Art and Design, OCAD-U, and York University, Devine's most enduring learning came from her grandparents, who were trappers on the Canadian Shield in northern Ontario. Devine's installation, video, and curatorial projects have been shown in solo and group exhibitions and film festivals across Canada and in the U.S., South America, Russia, Europe, and China, including the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Berlin Film Festival, and the National Museum of the American Indian in New York City, and today, and today Art Museum in Beijing, China. In addition to her art practice, Devine is a tenured associate professor at OCAD University in Toronto and the founding chair of OCAD University's Indigenous Visual Culture Program. So thank you, Bonnie, for being here today to share, us, to share with, with us your knowledge of Indigenous trade. Um, I'm so excited to learn along with you as, an, as the audience as well. All right, and now I would like to take a moment to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rochelle Laking. Uh, my Dakota name is Pete San Hoashtewe, which translates to white buffalo who speaks with a good voice woman. My name was given to me by uh, my family and ancestors back in Sioux Valley, Dakota Nation, um, a few years back during, with, during a visit with my mom. Uh, and I have to say, my ancestors, <laughs> they, they really knew it was coming for me because uh, I really strive every day to speak with a good voice, especially when dealing with other nations and everyone else's ancestors who, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm related to, of course. <laughs> um, I love my ZM. I love the opportunity they've created for me and others in telling stories that have been, well, histories that have been actively erased. I went through life with this idea that my ancestors were somehow uncivilized or, or primitive. I always knew this wasn't true, but um, the image is still kind of burnt into, into my mind. And it it's, has a tendency of kind of creeping up when, I, when I'm you know, going about my daily life. Um, the, act of de uh, the act of decolonizing one's mind is it's a, very, it's a very long process, but it's very, very necessary. <laughs> Um, I just want to point out the complexity of the name Toronto, which comes from the, originally from the Huron-Wendat word for fishing weirs, called Toronton, and that varies in different spellings. The spelling I use for the title for this talk, which I'm sure you've seen on social media, uh, Takaranto, is in the Mohawk language and is pronounced much differently, <laughs> which I'm going to try to pronounce now. I have uh, some Mohawk-speaking friends, so I'm sure they'll correct me later. <laughs> um, but you, spell, you pronounce it... Um, Gardundo. So the T's and the K's are, are much differently pronounced in the Mohawk language. How did I do, Phelan? <laughs> uh, there are a lot of street names here in Toronto that are linked to Indigenous languages, like the name Toronto itself. Um, are there any key place names that played a major role in the trade network? Bonnie? <laughs> I'll start, or we'll start with the with that question for you. Sure. Um, I think that all across Ontario, uh, of course, Ontario is a um, indigenous word. Toronto is an indigenous word. Takaranto. I'm not going to try and say it in the Mohawk uh, uh, pronunciation. Um, Canada uh, is an indigenous word. So, um, 
So if we uh, begin to think about this naming, and we begin to think about uh, the way that the names reflect an ancient habitation here. Is my microphone not working? Oh, sorry. So maybe, oh, there. <laughs> okay. Um, I won't go back and say all of that again. Um, but um, the names uh, that we are surrounded with inform who we are, whether or not it's conscious or not. And um, I've always been really, really interested in, uh, in how these names came about and uh, where they come from and how they can reconnect us in some way to a deeper history. So um, as uh, Rochelle alluded, uh, the word Toronto uh, refers to um, fishing weirs. Some people have translated this literally, um, and maybe some of you know this, this um, translation of Toronto, as um, the place where the trees stand in the water. You've, you, I see people nodding. Um, some people translate the word Toronto as the gathering place. Chris just died? No, okay. <laughs> um, I, and I don't know the exact entomology here, how it is that um, Toronto um, has these two separate meanings, but I think one of the really interesting ways to connect the name Toronto to a geographical location is to look at that word, uh, the place where the trees stand in the water. And the way that I like to illustrate this is using um, some very old maps. This map that's on the screen um, in front of us is from 1680. And it was created by um, the French. And uh, largely by Jesuit scholars and Jesuit um, um, missionaries who were traveling in this area and whose tradition was to draw out the, um, the roots the lakes, the waterways, uh, the rivers, um, so that explorers coming later would be able to find their way in the land. But this is Lake Ontario, Lac Ontario, or Lac de Frontenac. So the names here in uh, European terms have gone through several iterations, but it, what it, it, it really talks about, I think, um, when we refer to Lake Ontario, it's a Huron-Wendat word. And it means the place of beautiful water, where the, the and it describes um, the effect of light on the surface of the water. That's what Ontario means. Um, here, we see um, the area where Toronto is located at the top of the um, of the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And in those days, back in 1680, of course, it was mainly a fort here. There was um, a settlement by the French, um, and uh, that was the, um, the place where European settlement began. But prior to European settlement, of course, this had been a commercial site for thousands of years. How do we know this? Um, there have been digs all around Toronto that indicate that this was a place of significant settlement. Um, there are finds in the ground from um, places, um, things that you wouldn't find here. They're not native here. So we would find uh, turquoise here. Uh, there have been finds of copper here, uh, shell, all kinds of materials. And this is the uh, enduring record that remains in the ground that, that tells us um, that this was a significant trading zone. Um, we see um, the rivers, and uh, there's only one river here, it's the Humber, but um, our geography tells us we have the Humber, the Rouge, and the Don. So three major rivers that converge here um, in this place. There's also an island, and it's, it's depicted there as well. There's an island here that creates a natural um, harbor, a safe place for boats uh, to, uh, to land, to go into the harbor, and then uh, that harbor is fed by these major rivers, so people could come here uh, from across the lake and come around that uh, island, or they could come from the north down the rivers. Um, it is a 
perfect place. And we see it all around the world, that major commercial centers are sited on uh, estuaries or on uh, rivers. Uh, the Tigris and Euphrates, um, the Thames, the Seine, uh, all around the world we see this, and it is no different here. And I think that it's important as we're walking around in the city, and I always ask people, you know, go and walk and look and observe, and you will see the traces of this old, old, old commercial center here. There's a little dotted line that runs up um, from uh, this place called Toronto up to um, a... Uh, another lake, and I'm hoping I can move up there. Yes, I can, hooray. Um, this is Lake Simcoe, but back in the day, back in 1680, it was not called Lake Simcoe. The French in 1680 called it Lake Tarantan, Lake Toronto, and it is the original place that this name comes from. And the reason it's called Lake Tarantan is because of this, this image of the trees standing in the water. There was an old track that ran from Toronto up to um, Lake Simcoe, an old uh, First Nations or indigenous um, walkway that was used to carry goods because this was a central trading post uh, back and forth between um, Lake Simcoe and, and Toronto. And when Lord Simcoe, who was the first governor of Upper Canada, came here and settled here, he noticed this Indian track that, wa that, that led up and eventually led into this lake. And he thought to himself, this is a very useful little piece of engineering this road. Um, it allows me to get up to uh, Simcoe. Once you get up to Simcoe, it's a pretty short jump across a couple of portages through Fenland Falls, uh, to, across the land and over the rivers uh, to Georgian Bay. It opens right into Georgian Bay. This is Lake Huron. Once you get into Georgian Bay, whew, you can go, eh? You can go far. And if you don't go that way to get to Georgian Bay, you have to go down Lake Ontario. I don't know if this map shows it. Maybe not. You have to go around Lake Ontario. This is the Golden Horseshoe, of course. That's what we call it now. Here's Niagara Falls. You have to go down the Niagara River. There's a tremendous drop off there, very dangerous and scary. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there's Lake Erie. You have to go across Lake Erie to Detroit, what is now Detroit. Detroit at that time was not there, but you had to go to the St. Clair River, up the St. Clair River, and then, and then you get to Lake Huron. This is about a two-week journey by canoe. If you inst... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, eh? <laughs> uh, if instead... You, go, you use the old Indian track up to uh, Lake Simcoe and then across by a few portages into Lake Huron, you can move fast. Those Indians had an idea or two about how to move goods and people quickly. This road, he built a road. Sim, uh, Lord Simcoe decided that uh, this was such a useful avenue that he would um, make it a corduroy road. And so that's the first thing they did. They laid logs across it so that it could be used winter and summer. Later, they paved it. And later still, they named it. Does anybody know what they named this road? This is Young Street. This is Young Street. It still exists. And actually, it's Highway 11. Later, it became uh, Queens Highway 11 and extends all the way across Lake Huron, all the way past to St. Marie, all the way across Lake Simcoe, all the way to Rainy River. It is, and, and was, I'm not sure if it still is, because there's been development since, but 
It is the longest road in the world. Wow. <laughs> and it's for trade. And the trade that I'm talking about isn't only Eaton's and Simpson's, which is in the, or Hudson's Bay. This is trade on a, glo on a um, continental scale for indigenous people and has existed for thousands of years. Yeah, we usually automatically think, when we think trade, we think Hudson's Bay Company um, and furs, furs and blankets. Yes. <laughs> I brought a couple of images of the trees standing in water. This is the old fishing weir. This was the reason why um, the, uh, the settlement here at the, uh, that foot of that walkway, where we are sitting now, um, was connected in the first place um, up to Lake Kuchiching. Um, near Aurelia on the Rama Reserve. And it's because of this. Um, these were the original trees standing in water. These were the original, this is where our name comes from. They were um, a series of logs that were set up that were driven um, like stakes into the bed of the river, very close together. And the fish would come down out of Lake Kuchiching um, into Lake Simcoe, and it's right there uh, that there was a tremendous wealth to be had in terms of um, protein, nutrition. These, these weirs are still visible. Um, they have been excavated and rediscovered, and this is why we are called what we're called. This is why Toronto is called what it is. And it was actually a mistake. You know, um, Simcoe sort of mistook the place where this was, because it should be up in um, Lake Kuchiching area, Rama Reserve. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> you, uh, we, we'll ask another one. Yeah, so, yeah, I think we, we touched on it ju just slightly. Um, when we do think about the fur trade, we think of just trade our furs and, and blankets. Um, but in my research, I discovered that fur was just a very small part of the bigger picture of trade goods. Um, could you talk a little bit more about, about these trade goods? Sure. Yeah, we think about fur, but actually fur wasn't really that... I mean, fur was very plentiful. And most people in the northern regions of uh, the uh, continent had um, very ready access uh, to fur-bearing animals. And so there was a lively trade among um, native people for furs, but not so much with the, um, with the newcomers, with the settlers. But what we mostly wanted to trade were other goods. So this is an old, old map of um, the Great Lakes. And what I wanted to show you was the way that you could get across from Lake Ontario across, here's Lake Simcoe, Here's Georgian Bay, Lake Huron. Here's Manitoulin Island. Once you got into this um, area, you could shoost across the North Shore, the North Channel, between Manitoulin Island and, uh, and the um, Canadian Shield. Here's Sault Ste. Marie. There was a falls there, but it was shallow. That's why they call it a Sioux. Uh, you could uh, shoost across there or portage across there and either go down into Michigan or go further north to Lake Simcoe. Once you were in Lake Simcoe, on Lake, I'm sorry, Lake Superior, once you were in Lake Superior, you, the west was open. If you go to the very end of Lake Superior, there is a river here. Its roots are right at the, the far western tip of Lake Superior. Does anybody know what this river is that, that has its roots right there? The it's the Mississippi. And of course, Mississi that we go back to naming. Mississippi is an Algonquian word. It is an Ojibwa word, or, um, and it means um, sippy. Every time you see that word sippy, it means river. Mississippi means the, the shining river, the beautiful river, the broad river. And the Mississippi, so if you could get from here, which is Toronto, across to Lake Simcoe, across this north channel, 
across Sault Ste. Marie and into the Lake Superior and go along the North Shore, you could get to the Mississippi River. And once you got to the Mississippi River, you could get to the Gulf of Mexico. And so now I'll answer your question. You were asking, what are the kinds of trade goods that, that came up into this region? Well, corn, hugely important corn. Corn was developed in Mexico, in the Gulf of Mexico, and south of there in Central America. How did it get here? Up the Mississippi River. Up the Mississippi River, you could get into uh, Lake Superior and you could carry it across. If you didn't want to go, I'll have, I have other slides later that I'll show you where it all connects. But you can um, reach this area pretty quickly using the rivers. And this is how um, the corn came. Um, the corn had tremendous influence here in these parts because prior to the arrival of corn, the people here were hunters and gatherers. They were not farmers. Um, farming is, involves a huge um, shift, both in the economy and in the way of life of the people. Once you are a farmer, you're not moving around anymore. You have something to protect. And so we see the development of palisaded towns and um, settlements that included enormously huge fields of cultivated grain. They would grow corn, beans, and squash. Yeah. And um, Michelle has included examples of those three crops um, in the exhibit around the corner. It was excavated from the Huron-Wendat site, um, the mantle site, they call it, their archaeologi archaeologists call it. Um, but yes, we have um, corn, squash stems, beans that were all preserved in, in like a waste mound that was just on the outside of the, yeah. on the, the village, mm -hmm. well, no, the community. Mm -hmm. um, so corn was coming up, beans and squash were coming up. It was changing the economy here. From the north shore of Lake Superior, in exchange for these agrarian goods, copper was being taken from the, I don't believe that that we actually dug into the ground to remove the copper. I think that there was sufficient copper lying on the ground or visible on the ground that could be um, gathered and worked. And so we see copper down in Mexico. And they don't have no copper in Mexico that I know of. It came from here. And we see turquoise up on the north shore of Lake Superior. And there is no turquoise in these parts. It came from Mexico. And it came on these canoes that were traveling all through the region. Similarly, wampum. I know you're all familiar with the wampum belts and the kind of beads that go into the production of wampum. Well, we don't have the shells here that make wampum. Wampum, it's an Anishinaabe word, again. Where does wampum come from? Where do those shells come from? Anybody know? The ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, a thousand miles away. And yet, when the settlers came here, they, they, they knew. We were making um, treaties. These are language, these are documents. They're not, it's not money, it's not currency. These are documents and texts. We were making these and recording our history and recording our accords with one another using wampum beads that were um, woven onto uh, panels. Those wampum beads come from the Atlantic seaboard. They are two different kinds of clam. One clam gives you a purple bead and the other clam gives you a beautiful pearly white bead. And when the Europeans first saw these, they thought that this was money because they were so beautiful and they were so shiny and, you know, sparkly like money. People thought, well, this is jewelry. This is something valuable. Well, it is something valuable, but not in uh, economic terms. These are our stories. These are our histories. And the, the words and the uh, philosophies that are expressed in these wampum designs are the record of our journey through um, the creation of our relations with one another. So typically those wampum belts would be used um, for safe passage. 
you know, there were many countries here. There was Huronia, there was the Algonquian country, there was the Iroquoian country. The Six Nations were very powerful. If you were traveling through those countries, you needed uh, papers, passports. Um, there's good evidence to uh, suggest that the wampum beads were a means of showing who you, came, who you were, where you came from, and why you were traveling in that country. It was a kind of visa that allowed you to go through, that you had permission. And when we, you know, we did a land acknowledgement at the beginning of the presentation, that land acknowledgement derives from a very ancient custom here in Ontario and throughout North America that demands that when you enter someone's territory, you identify yourself. I'm Bonnie. I come from Ginabaching. I'm Bear Clan. My people are the Algonquian people. I'm here to represent them. And I am here in Mississauga territory. And so it is protocol for me to say who I am and then to acknowledge that I'm here on Mississauga territory and they've given me permission to be here. And that's really the root of our, um, of our land acknowledgement statement, or it should be. You know, it's a way of uh, claiming your own self, naming your own self, and acknowledging the people who actually own this country. So this is Manitoulin Island, and um, this is the North Channel that I was talking about. Well, the North Channel was extremely important to our people before the Europeans came, but it's extremely important today as well. It continues to be one of the most um, heavily traveled part of the Great Lakes, uh, certainly of the Upper Great Lakes. And those of you who've ever been to Manitoulin Island probably know this. It's extremely fertile farmland. And if you consider also where it is situated in Ontario, right north of it, the land goes from being scoured and uh, very thinly um, covered with topsoil, hardly any topsoil at all, conifer trees, um, you come down into Manitoulin Island, you're suddenly in a different climatic zone. Although it's not determined by climate, it's determined by the ground. This is the tail end of the Niagara Escarpment, which is pushed up against the um, bedrock of the Canadian Shield and is clashing here so that this country is made out of limestone. When you go there and you, and you walk around on Manitoulin Island, you'll notice there's no blueberries there. They don't have blueberries on Manitoulin <laughs> Island. How come? Well, it's because blueberries like it when they're on the rocks. They grow close to the ground with the lichen that hugs the surface of the Canadian Shield. Down here, there's no Canadian Shield. This is limestone. This is the Niagara Escarpment. They have hawberries there. It's always been curious to me. <laughs> they have hawberries there. But this created trade between the people who lived on the island who were farmers and the people who lived on the northern part. And it's just like you can walk across here. My people come from a little bit further west. But we can see Manitoulin Island from where, where I grew up, and you could almost swim it. But the climate, the flora, and the fauna, the people, uh, the animals that live there, and the uh, economic um, activities of the people who live there is absolutely different. How did that determine trade? It created a dialogue uh, between these people that endures to this day. I wanted to show you the extent of the rivers because I think that this is, um, this is absolutely essential to understanding the truth about North America and the truth about the situation of Toronto. You can see that if you can get into the Mississippi River, you can get to the Missouri and go all the way to the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. This is enormously important. Here's the Ohio River. So if you go a little bit further, down the Mississippi, you get onto the Ohio River. This will take you all the way to upper New York State and Pennsylvania. 
this is the bread basket, of course, of um, most of our people. And this is the bread basket not only for today, not only now, but 12,000 years ago. People were um, growing corn here. They were growing corn of um, a more plentiful variety than we grow now. The, um, the cultivation of the corn was actually, um, I think of it as an art form. They had corn for every purpose. They had corn for every color. It was not only uh, a nutritional uh, dietary thing. It was used to make fabric. It was used to make uh, writing paper. It was used uh, for medicine. It was a incredibly diverse and important crop. That's why it spread all the way from uh, Mexico all the way up to this country here and now it has spread around the world. It is the most cultivated grain in the world. It is the most hybridized grain in the world. But the history of its hybridization did not begin 40 years ago with European experimentation. That hybrid um, experimentation began 12,000 years ago in Mexico. And I think we need to recognize that as well. So here's the Mississippi. And again, what it means is beautiful water, the river, uh, the beautiful water. Um, I just love this slide and I just, you know, want to show you uh, what that meant to us, what it continues to mean to us. Um, it's like an um, artery. And I believe that um, what, we, what we see when we look at um, the arteries that run through this country, we begin to understand um, the canoe culture that was here, the trade culture that was here, the, um, the way that people were mobile in ways that they are not now because, of course, as soon as uh, settlers began to arrive here, they began to um, stop us from moving around. They began to settle us in, um, in reserves where we were not allowed to practice our trade, to develop those relationships with one another, and to move freely throughout the continent. They essentially destroyed the economy that was here existing to insert their own economy on top. And I think we need to know that if we're going to talk about reconciliation in a meaningful way. That reconciliation is an economic situation. It is not only about me saying, yes, I see you, and you, thank you, you see me, and now we can go on our way. No, there is an economic um, layer to reconciliation that has to do with reestablishing and supporting the economies that were here before and to um, allow them to flourish. I just want to show you the diversity of population. We've done a lot of talk about the water and the land and the crops and the, you know, the trade goods and so on, but there are people here as well. And I want to talk about these uh, people because they are essential to our discussion about the complexity of um, this place that we are in. This map is divided up according to linguistic uh, categories. So these are, um, broadly speaking, um, the, um, the mother tongues that are spoken here in North America. And you can see this big gray area. It starts here in uh, Newfoundland. It stretches down. This would be uh, Nova Scotia, thank you. Um, I think that this is Manhattan. Um, right down here to around Cape Cod. It goes across, uh, this is the Mississippi River, here. It goes across, this is um, Lake Manitoba, Lake Winnipeg. It continues across Saskatchewan right to uh, the Rocky Mountains. This is the territory of the Algonquian-speaking people, the Anishinaabe. Those are my people and you know, there may be some of us here in this room right now. The Mississaugas are included in this group. The Mi'kmaq are included in this group. The Delaware are included in those Algonquian-speaking peoples. Uh, the, uh, I've mentioned them already, the Odawa, the Ottawa, the Winnebago, uh, 
There's a little tiny group of them down here. Uh, those are the Cheyenne and the Arapaho people. They speak our language. This area of um, Algonquian um, language-speaking territory is almost the size of China. When I was growing up, we were told that we were uh, an insignificant group of people, the Ojibwa, that we had, because we never had a big war. We didn't have any big heroes. And there was not anyone that we could point to to say, there was a guy, right? Or those, those people were great. We were um, uh, not like that. We were not warlike. We were not great diplomats. Uh, we were interested in maintaining the um, integrity of our trade networks, uh, the integrity of the Great Lakes. You can see that most of the Great Lakes fall within our territory. The Mississippi falls within our territory. We were interested in moving around, in being free, and in uh, selling and trading our goods back and forth. This area here, all along the St. Lawrence River, uh, across Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, down into um, the northern part of uh, New York State, and further south down here in Kentucky and Tennessee. These are the Iroquoian peoples. This is when you, when you hear people saying, well, I'm from Six Nations, that's who those Iroquoian people are. There are Six Nations who formed a confederation, but there are much, there are many, many more Iroquoian speakers than just the Six Nations. So the Huron are Iroquoian speakers. The Cherokee are Iroquoian speakers. They have the same language group, and they have the same fundamental uh, metaphysical approach. I'm not going to say religion, uh, because our religions are more than just religions. They are philosophies. And uh, so the Iroquoian philosophy and the Iroquoian way of living on the land is very different from the Algonquian. And when you hear people talking about Ontario, I feel it's important that you understand that this is a place that has been shared between the, the Iroquois and or the Haudenosaunee, you'll hear that word for them as well, and the Anishinaabe. And that we are struggling still to this day to find peace between ourselves. Because when the British came, they divided us. They gave a huge tract of land uh, right in the middle of Anishinaabe territory, the Mississauga territory, uh, to, the, um, to the Mohawks. And this has set us up against one another, and we need to fix that. That's what reconciliation to me means, that we fix Yes. That needs to be said. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Also, there are villages and settlements along the Grand River that are quite old, like in Kitchener, that are home to home. Mm -hmm. And and I thank you for this because this is precisely the um, the discussion that we continue to have among our own people is to try to find where do we belong. So much of our old villages have been um, erased, so it's very very difficult for us to untangle this, and we do easily become incensed with one another, and this has been a problem, eh? within nations, right, that do need to take place because people become argumentative to the point where no one's listening. Yeah. And, uh, and that's not good. I yeah. mean, I, I don't wish anyone else any ill will. Like yourself, this is, I think it's great you're presenting to hear, to hear. It gets people to think about these lands in a different way, you know. Uh, 
also that reconnection to the land and how important it is too. I think part of your talk is showing that, whether that's the intention or not, but that shows that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, like the Iroquois, that means like striking rattlesnake. Oh yes, that's it's a pejorative a term. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. We, we struggle with the ways that others have named us, and we struggle to reconnect with our own names. And